The best thing about my job, working as a conservation officer for Natural Resources Wales, is getting to come to fantastic sites like this in the Wye Valley and actually getting to actively deliver practical conservation management on the ground. The Wye Valley Woodland SAC, or Special Area of Conservation, is a European designation and it's, it's, a, it's a series of about 16 woodlands scattered on the English and Welsh side of the River Wye running from Chepstow up to Monmouth. It covers an area of about 900 hectares. Um, within these woodlands they've, they've been designated for the beech woodland within them, the ash and lime woodlands that you get on the slopes on the river's edge and for the yew woodland as well. The woodlands are sectioned all the way up the Wye on both the English and the Welsh side. It's, a, it's just a fantastic natural resource that people use. You've got the Wye Valley Walk runs through here, you've got the Offers Dyke Path. You get a lot of footfall through this area and the rest of the Wye Valley area of outstanding natural beauty. The AONB covers 128 square miles from uh, Hereford in the north or just south east of Hereford in Herefordshire down to Chepstow in the, in the south, nationally designated protected landscape and I manage the small team and there's five of us that uh, coordinate a lot of the conservation, um, tourism, recreational management. Typically you've got two kinds of woodland, you've got conifer woodland and broadleaf woodland. Conifer woodland consists of evergreen trees, so conifers, pines, things like that that don't shed their leaves typically um, and they'll often be planted for timber production so if you look at them they'll almost be planted in rows they'll have a very sort of regimented fashion about them. Broadleaf woodlands they naturally occur and those woodlands can look a little bit more haphazard a bit like you've got here with trees sort of cropping up all over but as you understand woodlands more you can look at them and you can actually see historic management within them. So this is a really good example of the yew woodland that you get in the Wye Valley. So you've got these really, really old, twisting, gnarled trees. They've got sort of a, a brownish, reddish tinge to the bark. Um, it's an evergreen species, so it doesn't lose its leaves. Um, the yew trees, the leaves are all, all grow sort of on a single plane going from side to side. The other way you can tell yew trees, well, they're male and female, but the female plants produce these lovely red berries, which are kind of quite sticky if you squeeze them, um, which I think the birds like to eat. It's an incredibly long-lived species, so it'll be longer lived than any of the other trees you get in these woodlands. Here we've got a little beech seedling. Doesn't look much like a beech. It's, uh, it's two leaves, it's dicotyledonous, so there's two leaves. So these, these establish into large, mature beech trees. They're big, mature trees that they've got generally relatively upright, quite uniform, the main stem of it is kind of a grey bark and look a bit like an elephant's leg. So you know when you've got beech trees in your woodland because as you're looking at the ground floor level and the ground floor, there'll be a carpet of these sort of brownish, orangish leaves all over it, as well as the nuts that the tree produces. So you get a lot of this in the leaf litter. And this is a small lime tree. On the adult line, the, the leaves won't look anything like this. They'll be a heart shape. You, you've got this sort of fissuring in the bark, a kind of a, a greyish stem. And this is an old coppice, so this is now three big old stems that have been coppiced a fair while ago now. And that's your lime leaf there. It's kind of heart shaped. You've also got some ash seedlings coming through as well. So you can see the, the leaf there of the ash. And you, you want to see new regeneration of the canopy tree species so that in time, to, in time when the older trees fall over or all go over or they're managed and taken down, there'll be a next generation to come through and reach up into the canopy and maintain that woodland structure. People who know an ecologist will know that you don't ever simply just go for a walk. Uh, it normally takes at least twice as long there's just so much to notice and to look at. You know, for example, I've got here a fallen tree. It's gone down, the tree itself is dead. I mean, you can see this is quite, quite soft, very loose. You'll get beetles that bore into that, they feed on it, have a very long larval stage because it's very hard to break down and get any useful nutrients from this decaying heartwood. Um, you've got all sorts in there. You've got small little beetle holes that I can see 
in the underside here, there's some here, there's some here. So those are probably where a small beetles bored into this and has just basically gone through its life process and emerged as an adult. There's all sorts that goes on in these, these deadwoods. So although it is deadwood, it's actually alive and bustling. When you're walking through the woods, you might come across a carpet of what looks like white daisies. These are actually an ancient woodland indicator species. You only really get in semi-natural ancient woodlands. They don't colonise new, new woodlands particularly easily. They're actually called wood anemone and they're from the buttercup family. Although they're not yellow, they're actually white flowers. And they've got six petals, they're tissue paper thin, the flowers. They're very delicate and they'll come into flower around sort of April, May time. They're some of the earliest flowering plants in a woodland and they add a real nice bit of colour to the ground flora in a woodland early on. Here we've got a thick green carpet of um, wild garlic or ransoms and literally as you step through it and you crush the leaves, break the leaves, it really gives off a smell of garlic so you know you're in garlic. And it's not in flower yet, although this one is just starting to come out. They're really delicate, they look like your alliums you get in a garden if you're a gardener. Um, and soon enough this will be a profusion of these pom-pom sort of shaped white flowers. And it's actually got several flowers to each plant. You see one, two, three, four so far, there'll be more where that came from. Isn't so when it's fully in flower, oh look, we've got a little beetle on there as well. It's already getting in and collecting probably the pollen, getting the pollen off the plant. There he goes. Okay, so here's a, a common woodland species that most people will know. It's, um, it's the bluebell. This is our native bluebell. There is, however, an, a non-native species, the Spanish bluebell. The easiest way to tell the native bluebell from the Spanish bluebell is that our native plants, the head nods and the flowers all hang one way. You've also got narrower leaves on the native bluebell and they're more of a, a purpley colour, whereas the Spanish bluebell is actually a slightly lighter shade of blue. It's really good actually as an early flower species, you often find sort of queen bumblebees as they've just come out of emergence foraging on this, taking the, the um, pollen from the plant which they'll use to rear their first brood of workers. You've got a nice little cluster here of, um, it's called moshcatel. It's a nice little woodland plant, another little delicate one. You don't see it everywhere but um, it's nice to, nice to find when you do see it. So it's got like one, two, three, four, it's like a square face of flowers and then one on the top and it looks a bit like I think that's why it's called um, clock tower or something like that it looks a bit like Big Ben in the sense that it's got the four faces Herb Paris that's a that's a beautiful plant actually it's um it's got four leaves and a, a sort of a bulbous flower in the center of it um, you get patches of that you will just spot patches of it from time to time as you're wandering through a woodland some have got loads some you just get small patches of it all right so this is a um, toothwort it's a parasitic plant which is why it's white it doesn't have any chlorophyll um, it gets its energy from tapping into the root systems of hazels and elms and other plants it comes out early in the year it's got this sort of these these flowers that are sort of thought to look like teeth hence the name toothwort the latin name for this plant actually means secret and that's because for most of the year you wouldn't know it's there it's only at this time of year sort of springtime around April, May time when it starts to come out. There's another one just here that's coming through that you actually realise that you've got the plants in the woods. You know, I've seen the active conservation and enhancement of the, of the landscape and the features in it. Um, and, you know, communities coming together through things like the Wye Valley River Festival that we ran last year. There's a lot going on. Meanwhile, the trees are growing gently, the, you know, the river flows by. Most people think, you know, the place hasn't changed at all, but it's all kind of subtle evolution. A landscape like this uh, has, you know, these woodlands have probably been managed for, um, you know, five to eight thousand years. If you were here maybe two, three hundred years ago, four hundred years ago, this was largely an industrial landscape. You know, these, these woodlands were coppiced on an industrial scale. There was huge amounts of river commerce, trade um, up and down the barges, the Y-Tros, um, taking produce up and down the valley. 
So it would have, the valley would have looked completely different a couple of hundred years ago to how it does now. Uh, you know, and, and this high, high forest um, canopy that we have in the Wye Valley woodlands now, probably these woods haven't looked like this for, yeah, for about 8,000 years. If we want to get the value out of the woodlands, you know, it's got to be managed. And these are awkward woods to manage because of the, the steep topography. You know, the river um, needs to be uh, managed carefully. It's a very natural river, although there are weirs and things along it. There is a right of navigation because of that historical transport and commerce on the Y. It's also very popular for fishing, but still also very popular for canoeing. So all of that needs careful management to avoid conflicts. Hi, I'm uh, Phil Mundell. I'm one of the walk leaders in this area. I'm interested in the history yeah. and I'm particularly interested in this area yeah. because it's just rich in history. You know, we're, we're standing in front of Giant's Cave and Giant's Cave is a, uh, you know, we're going back to what, 1751 so to 1760. Uh, whole, you know, knocked through in order to extend the walk from the Piercefield House right the way back to uh, just above Chepstow, just above the castle, the alcove. A beautiful walk created purely for this, for pleasure, for the picturesque, so that as you come around a corner and suddenly you're faced with a view like this, as you walk through the, through the cave, you emerge to the other side, another view, another different scene as you, as you come through. And this is what it was all about. And I, I, I just find this area fascinating. It's, it's just packed with history. I, 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 I think the thing with, with walking like this is that it, it, it affects all the senses. So, you know, you walk through the woods today, for example, you can hear the birds in the trees. You can see the views out here. You can smell the, 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 the vegetation. You know, it, it's just fresh air. If you're, walk, if you're walking with a group, there's another level as well, because what you've got now is a social side to it. So if you watch a group walking, walking through, as we were on Monday, uh, everybody's chatting and there's little groups and the groups are changing and it's a social, a social event. If you're running on a treadmill in a gym, I, I, you know, there's nothing more soul destroying. Watching a television, watching something you don't actually want to watch. I, I, no, I, I, this, is, this is the life for me. This is the way you keep it fit. It's remarkable actually how walking can, can make such a difference to health. Um, we, uh, Helen and I would uh, walk with uh, a group for uh, Walking for Health on a Monday. And we've, over three years, we've watched how people have improved in fitness. You know, week on week, you watch them steadily, steadily improve until, you know, it makes a huge difference to health. Helen Keneally, I live in the area and have done for over 20 odd years. I'm Secretary of Chepstow Walkers are Welcome. I used to help or and still do uh, organise the Monmouthshire Walking Festival to bring people into the area and to show them what we have here. Um, although the Wye Valley has always been a, a centre of tourism, as way back in the 17th century, um, it's, it's just lovely to bring people here and to, and to help the businesses flourish as well. And I was worked in the police force for 35 years and didn't really have time to walk that properly. But it is a way of just leaving everything behind and you can look at a view or listen to a bird or whatever and, and you can forget all your, you know, all the things that are going on really about you. I've got a, a couple of holiday lets and I've certainly seen an increase over the last five years with the coverage that we've had um, with the press, um, television, even to escape to the country where people come and buy houses in the area. I mean, obviously we've got Chepstow Castle is the oldest stone castle in Wales and Tintern. They come to walk, they come to cycle, they come to canoe the river. Um, there's just a massive, that everyone that does come says there is so much to do and, and they often return. I think I heard a quote once, it's like a good recipe, you want to share it with everybody else and that's exactly what, how I feel about uh, Monmouthshire and the Wye Valley. Walking is a big part of, of tourism here. I mean we reckon we get about 2 million, I think 2.2 million visitor days uh, in the Wye Valley per annum. It's about um, 
It's about 1.4 million visitors to the, to the AONB and uh, most of those are just here because of you know, the countryside, the landscape, the opportunities for um, quiet recreation. The Wye Valley area of outstanding natural beauty has a lot of tourism as a result of the beautiful settings, the history of this area, the, the important wildlife that you get in here. You get a lot of people come through and, and tourism is, is worth an awful lot of money to the Welsh economy. So I like to think I do my little bit by keeping these woodlands nice, making people want to come and see them and witness the, the fantastic wildlife you've got here. So when you're next out with your friends, your family, your children and in the natural environment, it's like, take, take the time to enjoy the senses, the smells, the sights, what you can hear and explore it, understand it. It's, there's so much to learn about the natural environment. You'll never know it all, but you know, if there's, if there's things that you don't know, it's, it's, it's good to be inquisitive and want to learn more. So, you know, there's, there's ways you can find stuff out. You take a picture with your phone, you can check it online and back at home on the internet. You can, you can tweet us, you can tweet, you know, your local record centre, you can send the photos in to your museum, whoever it may be. But I think it's important that people should, should care about the natural environment and want to learn about it and want to understand it and, and value it as much as they possibly can.